Hey there, Red here, and welcome to Red Hunt, the place where listeners like you gather to dive deep into the world of relationships through the captivating stories from the Reddit community. So sit back, enjoy, and don't forget to hit that subscribe button for more amazing content. I found out once again that my partner of 12 years has been stealing money from me. I am feeling confused about my husband's behavior since we had our baby through in vitro fertilization, IVF, five months ago. Despite my expectations that he would be a great dad, he has been distracted and moody. Our baby is doing well, sleeping, eating, etc. But I have taken on the majority of the physical and mental responsibilities. All he has to do is watch her for a few minutes in the evening while we get ready for bed. He works from home three days a week and could spend time with our baby, but he often claims to be too busy. I've noticed he spends around eight hours on his phone. After work, he rushes outside to do chores, which coincides with the limited time he could have with our baby. I've tried to reason with him and begged him to prioritize quality time with our child, but he insists these tasks are necessary. He does make sure I have food and water most days, but it feels like he's doing the bare minimum. We argue frequently, and he accuses me of portraying him negatively and not setting him up for success. However, I bring the baby to him, talk about her even when he doesn't ask, and share information about her likes and dislikes. He showers us with affection and then disappears. Since our baby was born, he has had five nights out, a work trip, and recently returned from a bachelor party where he didn't even bother to text me to let me know he was okay. He goes to the gym four times a week and has a Sunday morning running club. His life hasn't changed much, and I'm supportive of that because he claims it is essential for his mental health. His constant excuse is that he's exhausted and cannot sleep. Initially, he slept in another room for seven weeks after his two-week paternity leave because we co-sleep, and it's one of our rules. But he insisted on coming back, and has since disturbed our daughter's sleep multiple times. Now, when I put her to sleep, he sits by, engrossed in his phone with headphones on, yet claims he can't sleep. When I asked him the biggest change in his life since our daughter's arrival, he mentioned sleeping with the light on, as we keep a side lamp on for visibility, while he wears an eye mask. He has a persistent cough that often wakes the baby, but I usually don't inform him because his reaction is always overly dramatic, rolling his eyes and appearing disappointed. Yet, I have no breaks, and I struggle to even find time for a shower. I breastfeed and baby wear, and the only additional tasks he has taken on are occasionally making evening meals, I cook about three times a week, and loading and unloading the dishwasher, which I still do when I can. Whenever he has free time, he avoids helping out. If our daughter is asleep, he doesn't believe there is anything he can do and leaves. He rarely assists with laundry and does minimal cleaning. I'm not sure what I can do to improve the situation. I've considered seeking counseling, but it may not be financially feasible for us. At the moment, I am here with our sleeping five-month-old daughter while he is downstairs on the couch watching TV because he is hungover from a two-night bachelor party where he consumed alcohol and drugs. I desperately need help understanding what is going on. It sounds like your husband is not taking on his fair share of the responsibility when it comes to parenting your baby. You've tried talking to him, but he seems to prioritize his own needs and leisure activities over helping out. It might be worth considering couples counseling as a possible solution, although cost is a concern for you. Am I the antagonist for refusing to help an ex-friend with a reference for a job? My former friend Lily and I stopped talking a few years ago. I am still friends with her child's father, Mark, and she still claims to be friends with my husband, Jack Dottie. Lily lost her job a few months ago. Since then, Lily and Mark have been relying solely on Mark's job for income. I have spoken to Mark several times in the past few months, and he has mentioned repeatedly that they cannot afford things for their baby because of this. Last week, Mark approached me and asked if Jack had changed his phone number. I confirmed that he had, and Mark asked if he could have the new number. I questioned his intentions because, in the past three years, he never tried to contact Jack directly, except to say hi if he saw him outside, even though he had his number during that entire time before we changed it recently. Mark admitted that he actually wanted the number for Lily, so she could use my husband as a job reference. They used to work together years ago, and he even supervised her for a short period. I told Mark that they didn't need Jack's number and that he would not be helping Lily with a reference. Then, Mark asked if Lily could use me as a personal reference since we were close friends for about four years. I declined. In response, he called me a derogatory term and walked away. I thought that was the end of the conversation. Yesterday, I received a call asking if I knew Lily and whether I could vouch for her as a good worker and reliable person. I confirmed that I knew her but explained that, based on my over six years of knowing her, she was not a good worker or reliable person, both at work and in her personal life. The caller asked a few more questions to which I honestly responded, mostly regarding her punctuality. She was always late, even to events held at her own house or ones she hosted. And her ability to follow through on commitments, she never did. The caller also asked about her work habits but since I never worked with her directly, I shared what I had heard from people who did work with her, which was mostly negative. Today when Mark saw me checking the mail, he stopped me and asked if someone had called me for a reference for Lily. I confirmed that I had been contacted and that I was honest with the person. Mark informed me that Lily had just received news that she didn't get the job. 
and I replied that I wasn't surprised given his reaction to the negative feedback I provided. Mark then began berating me, calling me derogatory names and accusing me of not being kind when they needed a job. I told him that he should have asked one of her friends to provide a reference instead of me. He responded by insulting me again, blaming me for Lily not having many friends anymore, as most of them sided with me when they found out why I stopped talking to her, and suggesting that I should have allowed Jack to give the reference if I wasn't willing to be nice. I do feel sorry for their baby, considering their financial struggles. However, that is not my responsibility, and I made it clear that I wouldn't provide a reference for Lily. Therefore, I don't understand what Mark expected from me. It sounds like your ex-friend's baby daddy tried to use you and your husband for job references. You were honest about your friend's work ethic which resulted in her not getting the job, and now he's blaming you. You made it clear that you weren't willing to vouch for her, so it's not your fault things didn't work out. Am I the antagonist for refusing to discipline my son when my ex wants me to? I am a 28-year-old woman, and I have a son named Kai, who is 8 years old. Kai's father, Dan, is my ex-boyfriend who is 29 years old. Despite not being together, Dan and I have been co-parenting somewhat successfully for the past seven years, although we have had our ups and downs. Three years ago, Dan remarried a woman named Dawn. Since then, the three of us have been communicating regarding our son. However, things became strained when Dawn entered the picture. She started requesting days where Kai would be with her instead of me, even though Dan and I have joint custody of Kai, and he spends alternate weeks with each of us. Dawn wanted to spend time with Kai on her birthday, on part of Mother's Day, and during a trip she planned out of state for the day. I asked if I would get these days back during my time with Kai, but Dawn refused. She claimed it was about strengthening the parental bond between her and Kai. I refused to give up my days with Kai, which did not sit well with Dawn. Another issue arose when Dawn wanted to change Kai's pediatrician because she plans to switch to a different one when she and Dan have their own children. Dawn is currently pregnant. I objected because the new pediatrician would be farther away from where we live, resulting in an extra 30 minutes of travel time. I also really like the current pediatrician, as does Kai. Dan sided with Dawn, arguing that she should have a say in some decisions. I pointed out that if that is how it works in their home, then it would be making a decision for me as well, and I disagreed with that. Kai and Dawn have a difficult relationship. While he doesn't completely hate her and has said some nice things about her, he also has negative things to say. He finds her overwhelming and doesn't appreciate her desire to be his second mother. According to Dan and Dawn, they feel that Kai refuses to view Dawn as a parental figure, which bothers them as they want her to be his second mom. Kai attends a junior coding school once a week, and he has been going there for almost two years. Recently, Dan and Dawn updated Kai's child information and added Dawn as a second mother, which is allowed. However, when one of the teachers at his coding class referred to Kai's moms, he corrected her by saying he only has one. This sparked a discussion, and the teacher made the change back to the previous format where Dawn is listed as an emergency contact, but not as a parent. Dawn found out about this a week later when she picked up Kai. She and Dan decided that Kai should be punished for this incident. Dan then told me what happened and expressed his belief that Kai should be punished by both of us for a month to emphasize the seriousness of the situation. I disagreed with this and also had concerns about listing Dawn as a mother to Kai. I informed Dan that I would not discipline Kai for this incident, and I did not believe they should either. He yelled at me, accusing me of not co-parenting and excluding Dawn, who he sees as an equal parent to Kai. Since then there has been a lot of back and forth, but I have remained firm in my stance. I also documented the messages regarding this situation. My ex claimed that I am undermining Dawn and their authority as parents to Kai. Am I the asshole here? It's completely understandable that you would be concerned about the changes in custody and the way Dawn is asserting her parental role without respecting your shared custody agreement. You have the right to advocate for your son's best interests, and it seems like Dan and Dawn are overstepping their boundaries. My girlfriend is sleeping over her unemployed older cheating ex-boyfriend's house. We have been dating for four months, but she was in a relationship with another guy for four years, and they lived together for most of it. She admits that their relationship was not good, and she realized this halfway through when he cheated on her. However, she stayed with him for a while longer due to the death of a family member. Although she claims to have broken up with him a few months before we met, she had sex with him two weeks before our first date. They also have an eight-year age difference. She started dating him when she was in high school, and they moved in together after graduation. She has a teenage brother who really likes him and even had him over on Christmas. Furthermore, even though she said she broke up with him a few months before we met and moved back in with her mother, she still has some of her belongings at his place. I've known her to stay over at his house on a couple of occasions to sort things out, but I'm not aware of the details of their conversations. She still has his number and is connected with him on social media. His place is about a half hour away from where she currently lives, and she doesn't drive, so that's probably why she stays over. She did inform me beforehand, but she didn't ask for my opinion on it. I trust her, but this situation makes me feel uncomfortable, and I worry that if I bring it up it may be turned against me. I enjoy spending time with her and our friends, but for the past two days, our friends have been asking where she is, and I feel like I can't tell them the truth. I love this girl, 
but now it's hard for me to think about her without negative thoughts about her ex-boyfriend, who was verbally abusive and unemployed. I've kept a lot of my feelings about this situation to myself. It feels like she doesn't want to hear it because she complains about him still being in her life. However, I have discussed my love for her with my friends, and I would be ashamed to admit that my girlfriend is sleeping over at her older ex-boyfriend's house, who cheated on her and is currently unemployed. I have been avoiding using profanity so far, but what is going on? What should I do? In summary, should I express my feelings? And if so, how should I approach it? How can I deal with these emotions in a healthy way? I'm not sure if I should bring it up with her as it might lead to an argument. It's understandable that you're feeling confused and concerned about your girlfriend's relationship with her ex. It's important to communicate with her openly and honestly about your feelings, expressing your discomfort and discussing boundaries that would make you more comfortable in the relationship. Seek support from trusted friends or a therapist to help process your emotions and navigate the situation in a healthy way. Been in a relationship since 19, contemplating being single. Posting from a throwaway account. My girlfriend, 24 years old, and I, 25 years old, met in college when we were 19 and instantly connected. She's an incredible person who has taught me a lot over our five-year relationship, and I genuinely enjoy spending time with her every day. My issue is that I never had the chance to experience being a fully independent adult with my own apartment, money and the freedom to be single, have fun, and date around. Sometimes, this makes me feel trapped in my relationship. I also worry that we might break up in the future, and I'll regret not having these experiences during my prime years. Recently on a work trip I had a little flirtation with a co-worker. There was nothing physical, but it has been on my mind as it reminded me of feelings I haven't had in a while. I understand that the grass isn't always greener, and being single comes with its own challenges. I'm particularly nervous about living alone. Currently, we live together, and I love coming home from work and being around her. When she's away and I'm alone in the apartment for a few days, I feel a bit down and bored. I genuinely enjoy having a partner to share life with. However, I do feel like we are at different stages in life. She is focused on personal growth, doesn't drink or do drugs, and prefers wellness-type events. I find this inspiring and admire the effort she puts into becoming her best self. On the other hand, I enjoy partying, going out, and meeting new people. Being single or with a partner who aligns more with my current lifestyle might feel more suitable. Nevertheless, I hesitate to end the relationship because, as I mentioned earlier, we have a great connection and I can envision a future with her. She is unique, and I fear regretting it if I break up with her. Even if we were to reconcile later on, our relationship would forever be altered. There are a few issues in our relationship that are not ideal. Our sex life has been lacking passion for a few years. We still have sex a couple of times a month, but I miss the excitement of building a new connection. She occasionally expresses a desire to work on making our sex life more passionate, but I'm not very motivated about it. Additionally, she sometimes has a short temper and can be mean. She's actively trying to change this, but her behavior sometimes makes me feel awful. It's especially challenging because I approach life with a positive attitude and strive to be kind to everyone. Her moments of negativity bring me down. I'm in a constant state of inner conflict and would appreciate hearing from people who have been in similar situations or any other advice. I'm trying to make a decision based on rational and emotional thinking rather than impulsiveness. It sounds like you're in a difficult position, torn between the stability and love you have with your girlfriend and the desire to explore being single and have new experiences. It's important to weigh the pros and cons of both options and think about what will truly make you happy in the long run. Ultimately, only you can make that decision, but it might be helpful to have an open and honest conversation with your girlfriend about your feelings and concerns. Am I the antagonist for not wanting my son to have any interaction with my toxic sister-in-laws? I am a 32-year-old female and I married my husband, who is 34, about three years ago. We now have a 20-month-old child and are currently living with my mother-in-law, Mill, to save money and buy our own place as soon as possible. My relationship with my in-laws has always been a bit difficult, but we used to be close with my sister-in-law, whom I'll refer to as Anne. About a year ago, things took a turn for the worse when my mill informed me that she and my brother-in-law, Bill, decided to sell my son's crib and convert his room into a guest bedroom. They mentioned that my son could use one of the single beds they would be purchasing, but they have been pressuring my husband to buy the beds. He has firmly stated that since they took away our son's bedroom, they should be responsible for choosing and purchasing the beds themselves. Personally, I would rather have my son sleep in our bedroom than share a room with someone else, mainly because I know we would constantly hear complaints if he slept in that room. We don't plan on staying in this house for long, and we are trying to save as much money as we can, especially because I am currently a stay-at-home mom. The situation escalated when Anne and I had a major argument a few months ago. During this fight, Anne directly told me that my husband and I shouldn't have gotten married because we are kids playing house. She also said that there is no place for us in my Mill's house and that we shouldn't have gotten pregnant or had our son. To make matters worse, while my Mill was staying at my Bill's house, Anne would visit unannounced and take pictures of the entire house, including our bedroom and bathroom. Additionally, whenever Anne comes to visit, my 20-month-old son happily approaches her, 
but she gives him dirty looks, and her children, age 7, 13, and 15, ignore him. Now, here's where I might be seen as the one at fault. Every time my sisters-in-law come to visit their mom, I take my son and retreat to my bedroom to avoid any contact with them and prevent myself from getting upset over their expected derogatory comments. Yes, they constantly make mean remarks. My mill thinks I shouldn't keep my son away from his aunts and cousins. However, in the past, when I left my son outside and stayed in the bedroom, I would hear them yell at him and call him names, telling him to F off or that he's so annoying or that he doesn't listen. It's worth noting that he is still just a baby. I don't want to expose him to any kind of abuse, even if it's meant as a joke, and I prefer to shield him from this kind of nasty behavior. So, am I the one in the wrong here? It's completely understandable that you want to protect your child from any kind of abuse or negativity, regardless of whether it's meant as a joke or not. Your primary responsibility as a parent is to create a safe and loving environment for your son, and if that means keeping him away from toxic family members, then you're doing the right thing. Thanks for watching. When you subscribe, make sure to hit the bell to turn on notifications so you never miss a video. To finish listening to all the stories, check out the playlist in the description.